Welcome to Colorado Springs Utilities Landscape Webinar Class Series. My name is Lance Ackerman and this webinar is on getting to know your irrigation system. Today we're going to cover the main components of the irrigation system and what those benefits of knowing these components are of the irrigation system. We'll talk about the point of connection, the backflow device, the controller, or the clock, these terms are both interchangeable and mean the same thing. We'll talk about control valves, sprinkler heads, sprinkler nozzles, and finally we'll end with drip irrigation. So let's get into the point of connection. What is the point of connection? Where is it typically located? And why should you know about the point of connection? So the what is the point of connection? The point of connection is at the point in which the irrigation system is tied in to the house or the domestic water supply. Generally, they can be located in a utility closet or a garage or just where anywhere in the house where you are having that domestic water supply introduced to the house. And why should you know about it? There are various reasons why you should know about it. Uh, two that I can think of for ir an irrigation standpoint is for irrigation startup in the spring. If you're familiar, familiar with these components, you can go ahead and start that irrigation system up for yourself. Um, for the winterization purposes, um, in Colorado during October, we might receive a cold snap where we're gonna get below 32, 32 degrees for a handful of days in a row. And then the following week, the forecast is to be 60 degrees or up to 70 degrees for the whole entire week. Um, so if you know where these components are, you can go ahead and shut that water supply off, uh, potentially drain it before a full winterization. And then when we're that following week, when we're in that 60 to 70 degree weather pattern, you can go ahead and turn that back on, give that uh, lawn of yours or those plants a little another sh uh, shot of water before you go ahead and fully winterize it. Um, Another reason that I can think of that it's beneficial to know these components and where they're located um, are if you have an irrigation leak, perhaps. Perhaps you have an irrigation leak. If you know where this irrigation valve is at, you can shut that irrigation water off and prevent that uh, leak from causing severe damage to the property. Also, if you know where these components are at, are at if you have a leak within a house, maybe you have a pipe that's leaking or something of that nature, you can go ahead, if you're familiar, familiar with these, these components, you can turn that water supply off and again, save yourself a whole lot of hassle of potentially having a lot of damage from a water leak. So it's really beneficial and to know these things and it can build on that foundation of being able to interact with your irrigation system on a more frequent basis. So we'll go ahead and talk about the picture on the right hand side here. At the very top of the picture here, we see this blue, uh, it looks like a traditional hose spigot handle, um, but this is just basically a, a valve that if you turn it all the way to the right, that's gonna shut the water off. If you turn this, this valve multiple times to the left, that's gonna open the water. So for your domestic water supply, this is traditionally left open because that's what's supplying that water to your um, tap at the, in the kitchen, to your shower, to all the other uh, areas of water inside your house. This water pipe here, or this copper pipe, this is the water supply to the house. Um, nowadays, we might see uh, a PEX water line that would probably be blue in color or if not white in color. Um, so it could be potentially be copper or a PEX piping system. Next, we'll talk about this other copper pipe. So this copper pipe here is coming all the way down and it comes and connects to this main water supply to the house. That's the irrigation water supply. So it, it tees off of that water supply to the house and it, it, it's supplying water only to the outdoor irrigation system. Right here is the irrigation valve and that is a ball valve. So it's, it works in a similar fashion to this gate valve, but this ball valve, rather than having to turn the handle multiple times to the right to shut it off, it's just a simple quarter turn. You would 
turn it to the left and that's going to shut the water off. If you turn it to the right in this ball valve, this handle here is parallel with this pipe. That means it's allowing water from this point to be introduced all the way through this pipe and outside to your irrigation supply. Further down the line, we have an irrigation drain valve and it's another gate valve. Rather than a ball valve, it's a gate valve. They both function the same way as far as allowing the water to flow or uh, tur be turned off. But this irrigation drain valve, is it's important to know where that's at and it's important to know what, it, what its function is because again, if you choose to to potentially drain that irrigation system in October when we're experiencing that brief cold snap. If you know where this irrigation drain valve is at, if you go ahead and turn this irrigation valve off behind it so that the way the water is not continuing to flow, if you turn that off and you open this drain valve, that's going to allow the water in the irrigation system to drain out of this point and into the floor drain on the, that would be located in the utility closet. So the main, main thing to know here is if you have this closed, this should be open to allow it to drain. If your water supply is on during the summer, you're going to want to have this shut because if that's not shut, your water is going to be flowing out of there, you know, somewhere to a host to get outside. So you want to have that shut during the summer and open during the winter. This valve here would be open during the summer and closed during the winter. So again, just understanding these components, it kind of builds on that foundational uh, knowledge of the irrigation system and it allows you to uh, interact with your irrigation system and can give you a kind of a peace of mind uh, if things were to go wrong. So from the point of connection, we're gonna to move to the backflow device. So the backflow device, this copper pipe here is coming from our point of connection uh, maybe in this example here, it's from the utility closet in the basement. That point of connection is that copper water supply, irrigation water supply line is coming outside of the house here. And then we have this 90 degree elbow here on the bottom here is a copper nut. So it's just another, uh, another area for a drain. So if you're, if you're draining that system for the winter or you're draining it for that quick cold snap, unscrew this nut here and that's gonna drain any additional water that might be uh, trapped inside this device. Um, so this backflow device, it's a safety measure required by code. Um, it prevents any sort of water that is on this outlet side of this backflow device. So this from this point on, it's going to the irrigation system underground. It prevents any water that's trapped inside of that system from being siphoned back to your drinking supply uh, into the house. So it's required by, it's a safety measure required by code. Um, these again, here's another example of a ball valve. Um, so this ball valve here is open since it's parallel with the pipe. And this ball valve here is closed since it's perpendicular with the pipe. So the way it would work now is if this ball valve is closed and you turn the water supply from the point of connection on inside, it would send water, pressurized water to this point because at this point the water is closed. If you turn this ball valve a quarter of a turn for it to be parallel with the pipe, it's going to allow that water to be introduced through this backflow device and through the rest of the, through the, rest of the irrigation system. So this component is always pressurized during the irrigation season. It's most, this component here is most susceptible to winter damage. So we, when we winter, winterize a uh, backflow device, it's best to leave these ball valves at a 45 degree angle, along with these valves over here. These are just another small ball valve with a flat head screw, screw in it that functions that ball valve in there to, for it to open and close. One pointer that I will add is if you're going to winterize, winterize your irrigation system, I would highly recommend having a landscape professional take care of that service for you to protect your investment. Uh, unfortunately, most compressors that, are, that a homeowner owns does not have the air capacity to fully uh, blow that or winterize that irrigation system. So I would go ahead and have a landscape professional perform that service just to protect your investment here in this irrigation system. This component here is about $100 for this component. Um, for an irrigation winterization, they can range maybe $40, but 
uh, that winterization is going to protect all of your components of your irrigation system. From there, we'll discuss the controller or the clock. So again, those terms are interchangeable. Um, I like to think of these as a fancy timer. Don't be afraid of it. It's best to be able to uh, familiarize yourself with the, this uh, component. Um, so if you think of it as a fancy timer, that should give you a little bit of confidence to go ahead and you know, program your irrigation system. So a fancy timer, um, think of it as for me, for I have a, uh, a, fan a timer for my holiday lights. So during the holiday season, I go ahead and plug that timer into the, the wall outlet. Uh, I program it by pushing down the tabs that says, please turn the lights on at 5 p.m. and leave the lights on through the night and then turn them off again at 6 a.m. That way I, I don't have to you know, manually plug that light, those lights in, and then that way the, uh, the lights aren't being illuminated during the daylight time when they're not, it's not really necessary. So think of the irrigation controller or the clock in the same manner. All it is is you are programming that controller or clock to signal for when the irrigation should turn on or turn off. Um, they can be located in the garage uh, or outdoors if it's an outdoor rated controller or it can be found in that same utility closet where that point of connection is at. Some irrigation controllers and clocks can integrate smart technology. So a smart irrigation controller, it can help with scheduling um, by providing the, the, the proper inputs. So a smart irrigation controller is gonna ask you questions of what type of uh, irrigation do you have? Uh, what is the slope? Is it a, a medium slope? Is it a severe slope? Uh, what soil type are you are you uh, irrigating? Are you using the sprinklers for? Uh, what plant type are you using these sprinklers for? So, the more accurate you can be with those inputs, the more accurate the scheduling will be. Another benefit of the smart irrigation controller is it can be controlled remotely. So, in a similar fashion to a, a lot of the other smart irrigate or smart products in the market today, it can be rem uh, controlled remotely from maybe your smartphone. So for example, this controller in the picture on the right hand side, with an addition of an, a, a, another component, you're able to control this irrigation system uh, with your phone from anywhere, uh, basically from anywhere that you have Wi-Fi connections. So if you're at work and you're like, oh my gosh, it is raining cats and dogs over here. Let me go ahead and turn off my, my, uh, my irrigation for tonight because I don't think it's gonna need I don't, I, don't need, I don't think we're gonna need to have uh, the irrigation run tonight because I had, we just got a whole bunch of rain. You can go ahead and do that. Um, you, can go ahead and you can go ahead and program those controllers from that smart phone uh, application. So um, that's one of the other benefits of it. it. They do have a savings potential, um, but I caution you on the savings potential because you can't just buy a smart controller and hope that it's gonna save you water. If you're underwatering and you get a smart controller and you provide it with those correct inputs, it's gonna schedule your irrigation. So now you might be uh, watering more for, and your landscape health and your lawn health is gonna improve, but you're not gonna get that water savings. Uh, vice versa, if you're overwatering, you're not watering efficiently and you get a smart controller and you go ahead and put those appropriate inputs and uh, variables into that controller, it, it, it can save you uh, some money on that, on that water bill. So um, it's highly recommended. And the other benefit is Colorado Springs Utilities offers up to a $50 rebate for any WaterSense certified smart controller. So I'd recommend checking those out. Um, one of the benefits is they are just a little bit more user friendly than the, than the traditional controllers or the clocks. Another component of the controller or the clock is a rain sensor or a rain shut off device. So what this does is it's wired directly into the controller. Um, and then you have a component that is outdoors. Uh, this, this picture on the right hand side here is the, is the rain sensor device. Generally, a lot of times it can be on the eave of the house, maybe on a gutter, just in an area where it's gonna receive un uninterrupted uh, rainfall. So it's not a good idea to place a rain sensor uh, beneath a tree um, or in, in an area where it doesn't receive that direct rainfall because then it's not really functioning as it should. Um, so what it does is it simply prevents water 
uh, watering during or after a rainfall event. So if you set this device to, uh, you know, we say I want it to shut off my irrigation if I receive a half inch of water. Okay, so if we receive a half inch of water, what's gonna happen is this device is gonna signal back to the controller that says, we received uh, the threshold of water that we needed to receive, so please don't turn on any irrigation for the next handful of days. Um, so basically it interrupts that, that controller that says, don't turn on anything because we just got some rain. Um, these can be wireless or they can be wired. Um, either one, they both work great and they can save up to 10% of the water costs. Um, so that's a significant savings and it's an eligible for a rebate. So you can pay for this device uh, easily in one season with the water savings and the rebate um, component. So then we'll move to the, from, to the valves or the valve manifold. So right above this picture is where you would likely find that backflow device. And then on the outlet, outlet side of that backflow device, it's going directly into the ground and we go into the ground and we have the valve manifold. The valve manifold here is this white piping, okay? So that's the valve manifold. And then on each one of these pipes, we have a black valve. And on the very end of the valve manifold, you'll have another uh, gate valve or another valve of some sort. That's another drain, drain point generally for your irrigation system. So when you're winterizing your irrigation system, uh, just keep, keep your eyes out for those drain valves uh, in these components here. So the, the, the valve manifold, we have a manifold here with valves. The black components here with the red wires coming out of it, those are the irrigation control valves. Okay, so we have the red wire You'll notice this black bundle of wire here that has multiple wires within it. This black bundle of wire goes directly back to the controller and is coming into this valve manifold or this valve box. You can see this black wire going back into the house. So generally, like I said, that controller or that clock is following that same path of that point of connection. So this controller is most likely in the utility closet we have this wire that is communicating, sending that electrical current, that low voltage electrical current to these, con to these uh, control valves to signal when these control valves should turn on. This system has one, two, three, four valves. So it's a four valve system or four station or zone. Station or zone are the same term and we'll expl I'll explain those coming up here next. From the valves, we have lateral lines. So for on this end of the, of the valve is a lateral line. So each lateral line is going to each station or zone. So this station might be perhaps the backyard. So we have a lateral line that is going to the backyard to uh, water your back lawn. The next valve here might be your front lawn. So we have a lateral line that is going to the front lawn this valve might be uh, a lawn or a plant bed on the, on the side of the driveway. And then maybe this last valve is a drip, drip valve. So we have four valves here and lateral lines coming from each valve. This valve manifold, the white component is always pressurized with water as it's connected to the point of connection. The lateral lines coming from each valve are only pressurized when the controller or the clock signals these valves to turn on. Think about these valves, these control valves, in a similar fashion to the ball valve or the gate valve that we discussed earlier. The only difference is, is these are controlled electronically. So that's where the controller is telling these, okay, open up and now we have water that's in our lateral lines. Um, so again, these valves are controlled to the wire are wired to the controller and that controller sends that signal to each one of these valves to turn on. So here's a quick uh, schematic of a property that you uh, just wanted to show what a station and what a zone are. Um, so we have area B, which is on the side of the driveway. Maybe it's the front lawn area and it's zone two, okay? So with inside this red circle, we have zone number two. 
This is the control valve for zone number two. So this setup is rather than having a manifold, we've this, air, this schematic has the valves located closer to the zone. Either one is okay, but traditionally in a residential setting, you're gonna see that valve manifold. Um, so zone two is being controlled by this valve. The blue lines are indi indicating the lateral line that's coming from that valve, okay? And then finally, this half circle or this quarter circle, those are the irrigation heads or the sprinkler heads. This is the equipment that applies the water above ground. So we'll talk about sprinkler heads. Really, there's two different types of sprinkler heads. One is the rotor, uh, which is one stream of water that moves back and forth. So it's generally on a geared or think of it as like a turret that moves that water back and forth in a pattern of uh, whatever that set pattern. It might be a 90 degree. So if this head, if a rotor heads in a corner, you only need that water to spray in a 90 degree pattern because if it was in a 180 degree pan pattern, you might be spraying onto a sidewalk or a driveway or where you don't want water to be uh, introduced. Then we have a pop-up spray. So as a, the pop-up spray is a set pattern or a multi-stream. Uh, so the pop-up head is going to pop up. It's going to be set in a set pattern. So traditional uh, a fixed spray nozzle. Uh, it might spray in a 90 degree pattern or a quarter circle and a 180 degree pattern or a half circle. And then finally in a full 360, which is a full, a full circle pattern. Um, this nozzle here is a multi-stream rotary nozzle. Uh, it's an efficient product that's been kind of introduced uh, recently to the irrigation industry that's much more efficient. These sprinkler heads need to be checked on a minimum of once per month. The reason why we check these is because they can both be easily damaged and can cause significant water waste. So the image on the left hand side is a sprinkler head that is missing the nozzle. So we have a, a, a pretty significant leak in that sprinkler head. Um, if you let this go for too long, it's going to cause some water damage in the uh, landscape. You're going to be wasting a whole lot of water that's not being put to beneficial use. And also it's going to affect the other irrigation heads within that zone or that station. So those aren't going to be operating efficiently. And if we're in June or July and you have this problem, you might start to notice and you don't, if you don't uh, correct it uh, quick enough or on, on an efficient basis, you're going to start to notice uh, some stress spots or dry spots in that, uh, in that lawn area. And on the right hand side is another uh, example of a broken head. Um, that's causing a significant lease that leak that's pooling and flowing across that curb and gutter area. The heads need to be checked regularly, not only for leaks, but if this head's tilted all the way to the left, like this image on the left hand side here, that's not going to be very efficient. Um, and what's going to happen again is in June, July, when we're receiving those really hot and dry time frames, you're going to start to notice some uh, stress spots or dry spots in the landscape. So it's beneficial to check these. And if we have the situation where maybe this head might have got kicked over or maybe it was uh, the mower cause it to, to lean over like that, go ahead and correct it, straighten it up. And that's gonna uh, provide a much more efficient water pattern for that lawn area to prevent that, um, that stress from occurring. Uh, perhaps on the right hand side here, we have a head that's been buried or maybe it's sunken below the lawn area. So what's happening is that that grass is not allowing this sprinkler head to pop up above the grass. And we're getting a whole lot of water below the root system or below the grass surface area. Um, and again, this can lead to uh, water damage, landscape damage. Um, you might, again, in June or July, you might start to see these really dry spots in the lawn area. Um, so it's, it's beneficial to check these heads regularly. It doesn't take much other than if you have a smart controller, even if you, if you don't have a smart controller to run those irrigation components during the middle of the day or at a time when you actually see them operating. So that way you can correct these problems. This is an example of a low head drainage problem. So this is pretty common right along. Uh, if you have a sloping yard uh, right along the, the sidewalk or maybe it's next to the curb area, but what happens is the water from the highest point of the irrigation system in that zone, if you don't have a head with a check valve, it's gonna to start to drain out 
and cause a really wet, gushy uh, spot right next to the sidewalk. So this is really common. If you see a head or if you see a leak right next to the sidewalk, generally, um, if it's not a broken head and if, there, if you don't see a, a major leak, this could, be the, this could be the root of the problem. So it's a low head drainage problem. Here's a quick uh, uh, graphic here of what low head drainage is. So in part one, the sprinklers are turned on they're running, the, the sprinklers pop up, pop up above the lawn area. This pipe has been filled with water. It's been pressurized. So now we're sprinkling the lawn. We're watering the lawn. Okay, so now the timer signals to that controller or that control valve to turn off. So now this, uh, this lateral line is no longer pressurized. It's depressurized. And we're on a slope here. So all that water that's inside that pipe is uh, going to gravity drain out of that lowest head. Um, so it's going to just slowly sleep out of that head right onto the concrete. As you can see here in this picture, it's going to just pull right here in this concrete. Um, if you have a head with a check valve in it, what, what, what it can do is it can save some water. Uh, it has a water savings potential because rather than it leaking outside of this head here, when the, when the pressure, when the sprinklers turn off and the uh, system depressurizes, we'll go ahead and keep all that water inside this pipe rather than just letting it drain out to a no beneficial use. So we can keep all that water in the pipe for the next time we turn that sprinkler system on. Again, Colorado Springs Utilities offers up to $5 per head for residential customers for a maximum of 80 heads per year. Next component is a sprinkler nozzle. So that sprinkler nozzle is a part of the sprinkler head. This is what applies the water to the area. Again, it's really beneficial to check this component on a minimum of once a month. Um, my best practice is I at least check it once a week, especially during the heat of the year, uh, summer because um, these sprinkler nozzles can become out of adjustment pretty easily. And the next thing you know, you're watering your driveway rather than the lawn. Um, all it takes is a simple adjustment and these repairs are very, very simple. If you have a nozzle that's not functioning properly, maybe it's clogged, you can make those repairs very, very easily yourself. Um, here's an example of that uh, multi-stream rotary nozzle. Um, so this is, again, this area, this component here, this red part is the nozzle and this black stem is a part of the head, but just this red part is the nozzle. So if you have a nozzle problem, those repairs are really simple. There's really three main types of common nozzles. Uh, on the left hand side is a fixed spray nozzle. So this goes onto the head and it's going to throw that water in a fixed pattern. The rotor head, it's a, it's a head, but within that head you have a nozzle. You can see that single stream that's going to sweep back and forth with that gear. Um, when in the desired pattern that you have set it in. And finally, we have the multi-stream, which is a newer, more efficient nozzle um, that has, it's part of a pop-up head, but the nozzle is slightly different in the sense that rather than having this fixed spray pattern, you have these kind of these, these fingers that kind of wave through the air that have larger water droplets. They're a lot more efficient. Um, do you have the correct nozzle? So maybe you are uh, in July, June or July and you're noticing, oh, this area is really dried out here. It's, this lawn isn't looking very good. Go ahead and examine that nozzle. Perhaps you have a, a quarter nozzle where you should have a half or a 180 degree pattern. So those areas aren't receiving the water that they should. The, le the picture on the left hand side here is an example of a fixed spray nozzle. You can see the 12 here, that's, the t that's how far the water is gonna be thrown. So that's 12 feet and the quarter is indicating that it's gonna spray in a quarter pattern. These lines here, that is showing you where the orifice of that nozzle is and where that water and what pattern that water is gonna be thrown in. So when you have this in your, in your landscape or in your yard, if this pattern here is not being thrown in the proper direction. It's a simple adjustment to make sure, okay, I need to make sure that this is at the where I want it to be throwing the water. Um, 
So you need to make sure that you have the correct nozzle for the proper location. Um, if you have a 10 foot nozzle or 10 half nozzle where you really should have a 15 foot nozzle, um, you're going to start to notice some landscape stress, maybe your lawn starts to stress out and vice versa. If you have a 15 foot nozzle where you should have a 10 foot nozzle, what's happening there is you may be throwing water, maybe it's onto the side of the house, maybe it's onto the street, uh, the sidewalk or the driveway. So you're throwing water or distributing water that additional five feet in an area where you really don't want to put water down because it's not being used beneficially. I would highly recommend visiting csu.org and uh, researching some of our awesome fact sheets. So we have one on how to change sprinkler nozzles. So I'd recommend checking that out. So we'll talk a little bit about the high efficiency mesh precipitation or these multiple, multiple stream rotary nozzles. What it does is it applies water at a slower rate. Um, it has a lot of larger water droplets. So that's a benefit for our, our community and for our, our region because generally if we have five mile per hour winds for that traditional fi uh, fixed spray nozzle, they have a smaller water droplet. So those water droplets are more susceptible to that wind drift versus this, uh, this nozzle here has a larger water droplet and it's less susceptible to that wind drift. So it makes a lot more efficient that applies water at a slower rate so that water can be more beneficially used for that landscape. It allows that water to percolate deeper into the soil um, for a bit more beneficial use for those plants. Um, as a comparison between the two nozzles, the multiple stream rotary nozzle or the high efficiency match precipitation nozzle as compared to the fixed spray nozzle. The fixed spray nozzle, I like to think of those as a fire hose and this, this uh, high efficiency nozzle, I like to think of it as a garden hose. So there's just a lot more water being distributed from the traditional fixed spray nozzle versus this high efficiency nozzle has a lot slower precipitation rate. So it's allowing that water to be used more beneficially. If you decide to install these nozzles in your landscape, due to the slower rate at which that water is being distributed to the landscape or to the lawn, you need to make sure that you program your controller to allow enough water to be used for your landscape. Colorado Springs Utilities has up to $4 per nozzle. A rebate opportunity for a maximum of 80 nozzles. They can be 30% more efficient just due to the uh, slower precipitation rate and the less wind drift and um, allowing that water to be used more ben beneficially in the landscape. Finally, we'll bring it home with a drip irrigation. So the difference between a drip irrigation zone versus a traditional uh, lawn zone or a sprinkler zone for the lawn, the sprinkler zone for the lawn, those lateral lines, which is this black pipe here, those, those lateral lines are traditionally buried uh, six to eight inches below the soil surface. Whereas drip irrigation, these lateral lines are right on top of the surface. So in this picture here, this lateral line is right on top of the soil surface and it's just buried below this mulch. Uh, drip irrigation has a, uh, it's a lower volume of water, um, it's lower pressures, and it's distributing that water at a slower rate and generally directly right to the base of those plants. So drip irrigation is used a lot of times for plant beds, flower beds, perennial beds, uh, or perhaps vegetable gardens. So due to that lower precipitation rate and allowing us to water directly to the base of those plants, it's recommended to uh, water with drip irrigation one to two days per week and to run those zones for 45 to 60 minutes for each time. So for in this example, this component here on the lateral line is a drip emitter and this drip emitter is applying one gallon in an hour through this distribution piping directly to the plant. So closing remarks, this is all foundational knowledge that's gonna set you up for best success in the future. Um, it allows you to interact with your irrigation system on a more frequent basis. And it gives you a little more comfortability with um, interacting with your irrigation system. This foundational knowledge can be usable for DIY work. So if, you're, if you have a, uh, a nozzle that's out of adjustment, 
if you understand that this nozzle is just a component to the head and you can adjust that, that nozzle yourself, um, or maybe you need, to, you need to replace a nozzle, if you know those components when you're going to the irrigation supply stores, you can go ahead and get the proper uh, part the first time you go to the, to the supply stores. Or if you're not choosing to do this work yourself, this can help with the communications with your uh, landscape contractor or whoever performs the maintenance on your irrigation system. You can go ahead and let them know like, hey, I think I got a broken head. And if you use the proper terminology, um, that will be a benefit for you, for you and your company for the communications uh, component. And then finally, this knowledge can improve irrigation efficiency. So going back to, if you understand that point of connection um, and you're able to extend the irrigation season just a little bit longer um, through maybe October before we really start to experience those consistent freezing temperatures, that's gonna improve that irrigation efficiency, improve that uh, health of that landscape. If you know some of these components, it can allow you to take the next step um, towards programming your controller properly, um, scheduling according to the season. If you know these components and you're interacting with them, it just sets you up for best success for the future and allows you to really take the next step into managing your irrigation system. So with that, I want to thank you for your time and thank you for viewing the Colorado Springs Utilities Landscape webinar series and please view our other videos. Thank you so much.